I've been having a few niggles with my right knee. I've been, I'm able to run and I'm doing quite a big program at the moment, thanks to Coach Liz. But every few days, it kind of gets sore despite my efforts to stretch. I, I've, fundamentally, I think, according to my physio, the problem is my right hip has really poor mobility. I guess it's part of getting old. And, and also my right ankle has very poor flexion. And and I guess what happens is this is, has a tendency to put my knee in a sort of compromised position uh, quite often. And there's very little margin to relieve pressure elsewhere uh, through my hip or through my ankle. Um, and hence the problem that I have. Getting rid of the cause of this is going to take many, many weeks of exercise and, and pretty good discipline from me. And I, I really wish that I paid a bit more attention to this kind of stuff earlier on in my running career. And uh, maybe we're going to hear about some of that sort of stuff, how to get onto the starting line in a better condition uh, today. So hi, and welcome to Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review books written for the runners, about runners and by runners to help you decide if you'd like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help you keep you motivated about your own running and maybe inspire you to try something new. My name's Alan and with my co-host Liz, we're going to talk with author Owen Everard about his book, Get to the Line in the Best Shape Possible. And probably also a bit about back health and back pain and basically maintenance stuff. So uh, Get to the Line in the Best Shape Possible is a collection of articles written by the author and assembled into a book under one of four categories. The four categories are lifestyle, training, supplemental training, injury, and health. So there are articles in each of these sections that are uh, related. And uh, the book is actually also available in audio format. And a little bit about Owen. So Owen Everard is a sub four minute miler, sub 14 minute 5k runner and sub 30 minute 10k runner. He's currently European over 35, 3000 meter indoor champion and has represented Ireland in distances from 800 meters to 10k. So fast runner knows exactly what he's talking about. Um, he's a chartered physiotherapist and Pilates instructor with a PhD in human movement. He specializes in low back pain, hip and knee pain. He used his background in physio Pilates and his own struggles with injury to help develop the sports Pilates program. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. And he's the inventor of the back aware belt. So welcome to the podcast. Liz, Alan, thanks so much for having me. Hi, Alan. Is there anything that we missed? No, no, that was a really good introduction. So I'm um, blushing here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I guess the, the first question, uh, just to get things started, is the same one we usually ask. Um, what kind of, I mean, a book is a big undertaking. So what made you decide to, um, to put this book together? And especially since uh, from what we see online, I think this is one that people can uh, just download for free in the uh, ebook version. Yeah, so, yeah. So how did you decide to do that? Well, to be fair, it's a little bit of a cheat code, as you said. <laughs> it's, I'm going to feel bad for people who put crazy amount of work into their book, like a beginning, middle and end. I have a PhD, so I'm kind of used to writing and I do a lot of articles for different newspapers in Ireland and mm -hmm. I've given different talks. So um, I had all these articles. And then so what I just decided to do was um, if people are asking me advice, I'd, I'd kind of often either like have written an article on it or then I would write an article like a newspaper article on it. So I thought, you know what, rather than I just thought it'd be nice to compile compile them all together, as you said, into those different parts. So it was actually mm -hmm. easier than <laughs> than for most people because I had all the articles. So I just literally had to go back over all newspaper articles I'd written and just compile them into the different sections. Um, so as you said, like the kind of four things the idea with the name of the book is, you know, how to get to the line in the best shape possible. And I think there's kind of four elements that are needed for that. The first is that lifestyle element. Um, you know, are you sleeping well? Is your nutrition correct? I talk about like these 10 laws of health and fitness. And then um, the second bit is making sure you're doing the correct training for the appropriate distance you're doing. Uh, the third is like the supplementary type of training, as you mentioned, you know, like how do you taper correctly? Um little mistakes that certain runners make, you know, uh, supplements that people can take, 
um, even like foam rolling and stuff. And then lastly is injury and history, as we said, and Alan, that's a great little story about your knee at the start. You know, a lot of times, especially for the marathon, people can get the training right, can be sleeping well, but then they're breaking down and it's like you're on the line worried about an injury as opposed to worried about trying to do your absolute best. So I feel like if you have those four elements correct, you're you're going to be in a good place on the start line. So that was the kind of um, motivation for the book. That was a long winded answer, but uh, <laughs> hopefully it's OK. No, that's that was great because uh, I think like that's a different angle because most people, I think, find the writing process difficult. It seems like you've done a lot of writing and now you just have to like put it all together. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I, so, I think you do hear some people who's who when you ask them the question, they go, "Oh well, I started off with a blog on my website, and I was writing like little blogs, and then it kind of grew from there." And um, it's not quite the explanation you give, but it is the sort of jigsaw puzzle uh, approach, which is you know, I wrote a piece, and I wrote a piece, and I wrote a piece, and I went, "Hey, why don't I fit this all together and to make a jigsaw puzzle?" Yeah, exactly. And I feel like they go very deep into one part. So I think that's really, really necessary for a book where for some of my pieces are more like, OK, here are the kind of as a good overview of if you yeah. kind of know this stuff. And then if you find yeah. it interesting, there's so many books, as you said, you've been doing the show three years that people can review and go deeper into all these. So it's more of that, like um, a lot of people, you, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And hopefully mm -hmm. with this book or these articles, you know, you might learn about running economy for the first time and then want to go deeper into that. Or you might learn about what lactic yeah. threshold is, or you might learn about, mm -hmm. as you said, like sports Pilates, and it allows you just to go deeper into whichever one um, so, you mightn't even have heard of before. So so how would you expect people to read it would they, or use it? Would they basically not read it cover to cover? They, they, yeah, I, I usually just, I would skim imagine. Skim it and find scan, a piece yeah, and then dive it. in. Yeah, skim it, find a piece that, like if you think in the training section, like there's different articles on, you know, like I just started with 5k. So how to get the best 5k and then are you ready to run a 10k, uh, how, the secrets of a fast 10k for a set, for example, and then we're on to like half marathon. So if you're getting ready for a half marathon, you might just go straight to those type of articles. Mm -hmm. If sleep is something that you might struggle with, you might go to like, you know, the seven habits of highly effective sleepers. If, you know, if actually staying motivated is an issue, you know, in the lifestyle, you might go to like, five things that carry out real change and transformation if if you want an overview you can go to the first part with that fitness evaluation so i think just scan it see what takes your fancy as you said it's their article so there isn't like there's no spoilers <laughs> yeah you don't have to yeah if you read the last article it's not going to spoil the first like no it, not at all yeah <laughs> Okay. Um. So actually, uh, I'm kind of interested in your background. It just seems like you've been in running and running related fields, like almost your whole life, because you're, you know, you're a physiotherapist, you're a Pilates yeah. instructor, it seems like you've kind of put in all of this um, it's almost like you filled in all the gaps of knowledge around running. And I don't know if that's how it happened or was some of it by accident. Cause I know like, if you ask me how I became a nurse, like it was completely by accident. So yeah. I don't know how it happened for you. I'm kind of curious, like what, what made you, um, decide to be a physiotherapist and then get a PhD in human movement, um, and be a Pilates instructor at the same time. Yeah, that's exactly it. As you said, it's I was running since maybe like 13, seriously 16. So then when you're running seriously, you're going to physios and you're like, oh, I kind of like this job. And it's a hard thing to know what you want to do. I know you went back to school later, but it's because it's mm -hmm. so hard to know at like 18 what you're going to do. Like I just thought, oh, physio would be a good job. And I was lucky. I do really enjoy it. And then, as I said, Liz, I was I was lucky. I was over. I went to um Montreal for like six months in 2008 working and um I was working in Champlain University so um or no sorry Concordia University and, um we were able to like sit in in some classes and then like also, also treat the kind of athletes so one of the people came in and they were talking about like the functional movement screen at the time and this idea that like like you were saying there Alan that like the area that's sore it, may, it mightn't be the area that's the problem mm -hmm. and it just kind of like spark something in me so I was doing my my physiotherapy degree at that stage and that made me go down that kind of just even doing the degree all about movement and 
learning more on the Pilates side and would have developed that a lot. And then I would have continued to run at a high level and you're just constantly like learning. And it's great because you have the theory, but you're putting it into practice. So you're kind of understanding what bits are working and what bits don't. And then I started getting a few injuries, as I said, and that really made me look at Pilates and kind of rehab and um, what I thought people were missing that a lot of the Pilates was just on the ground and really burning the muscles, but not then transitioning back to your feet for running. And that's, that's kind of where sports Pilates was born. It was a kind of a selfish enough uh, act that I wanted to yeah. get it right for myself and then applied it. And it was working quite well for. That, that was, that was kind of one of my questions because um, I, I, I saw your reference to sports. I see your references to sports Pilates and I was, to, I was thinking to the uninitiated, what's sports Pilates? It's a, a sub branch of Pilates, is it? And that the, the translates to running somehow. That's it. Yeah, it's basically Pilates for runners. I probably should have taught, called it that. The main thing I found there's two elements I don't like on Pilates. Uh, obviously, then I went on with the back of wearable, so I'm really into mm-hmm. the spine as well. The two things I don't like is one, there's a thing called a like, neutral spine, which is essentially like the back is safest when it's in the middle. You know, you don't want to be fully rounded or fully extended. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, where a lot of the Pilates moves are like they really imprint the back into the ground, which is fine for activation of muscles, but it, it ignores the importance of position. You know, if you just want like to the lower the, doses or exactly you take yeah. the you take the lower doses out of it. Yeah. And what why people do it is if you have the floor and you say imprint your back into it, like it's like you, people can't see, but if I have one hand and I want to contract the muscles of my one hand, my right hand. If I put my left hand up on it like a fist and push, it's much easier because I have something to push against. Mm-hmm. So it's the same if you're on the ground. If you push your back mm. into the ground, it's much easier to get the contraction of the core. But that mm. ignores how the spine normally should be. So then it's very hard to transfer that from the ground back into when you're vertical. standing because yeah yeah because you only you need that like you need a cue of like hitting something at the back and contracting and that's not the way we want to do it so that was one big element that i didn't like in pilates and then the second bit was just the tendency of when the muscle you need to activate the muscles on the ground so you need your bridging you need your glute clams you need your your core like i literally just finished a class just before i came in here and like my glutes are literally they were burning. I was doing repeated actions of of bridge. So you need that, but then you need to get back on your feet when those muscles are tired and then use them in the, like on the feet, because that allows your body to transfer back to where you're running. If it's only on the ground, it's a big jump for those muscles to know what to do when they're on your feet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just from my background, like with my PhD in kind of biomechanics, there was just I really like some of the things in, in Pilates, but there was a couple of little tweaks that I wanted. So I didn't want to call it like pure Pilates because it's like someone's going to think then, oh, I can just go and do this other class. And it's not correct. If they're doing those things, if they don't, if they respect the neutral spine and then they're getting you more on your feet. Yeah, go ahead. It's it's going to be similar. Okay. okay. Never heard of that. It makes complete sense when you explain it like that. I guess it's what's it's sort, it's sort of saying, if if I understood you right, it's really saying, Okay, let's take the exercise effect of Pilates and try to transfer it into a muscle memory of running. Yes, of. that's a way better way of yeah. saying it. We can cut mm. out my bit and just leave that in, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a very short podcast. Okay, thanks. Thanks for listening to Running Book Reviews. Thanks for guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's exactly it. That's exactly it. That muscle memory. That's a great way of, of phrasing okay. it, Alan. And, and are there people all over the place who teach this? Well, it's all online, so you just okay. follow me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But are you are you the only person in the world? Is this an innovative thing, or is this a? a or have you, or have you learned from somebody, or is it a or school? Is there a group? Like, do you have a yeah. school? Like, you teach others too? Uh, I haven't started teaching others yet. Like, you know. Um, okay. So, if people wanted to learn this, they can only learn it from Owen oh, Everard online. Well, my way, like, there's just there's other different ways. Like, you know, yeah, of I'm course. sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Like the exercises aren't you know i'm not i'm not like we're not hanging off the science. ground or anything exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so um but uh yeah no the way i do it is is unique 
Okay. Is the back aware belt, is that related to the sports Pilates or is that a different, uh, is that a different, it's a different, if it's a different topic. thing, you know, yeah, basically with the back aware belt, then just as you said that everything kind of like, you know, you, you're into running that things like physio will be a good job. You're into mm-hmm. physio. You, you're, you think you see that there's a missing piece of just focusing on the area. So you start looking at movement, you get injured, you start looking at Pilates, you see that that's missing. And if you add the functional movement bit that you had you could come up with sports pilates mm-hmm. one thing then i was finding was um when i give like especially back uh back patients rehab exercises to do they come back and they could be doing them incorrectly or if i was in the in the gym i'd feel like i'd have to bleach my eyes for seeing people with the <laughs> technique they were using you know i was like oh my god it's crazy so uh i had this idea for years like uh, probably 10 years i was like god if they could like see or feel what I see they wouldn't do that so then Mm -hmm. I was like oh I always thought um it'd be great if there was like a a piece of equipment that would like tell you when you were going into a poor position so I literally just emailed my local enterprise office about four years ago said listen I have this idea it's like this belt and it's a line on your back and basically when you move into a poor position into your back it starts vibrating to tell you and they're like oh yeah come in with your plans and I was like guys that that is the plan (laughs) (laughs) that's all i got got. (laughs) (laughs) but in fairness they were like you know what they said look we'll give you half the money back up to like fifteen thousand euros if if you can get a prototype and they were super helpful um i got it now i'm still working on it like a new unit came today and we we're just they're just working it out like it's been panic stations because a couple of people are waiting on it but yeah that's the idea that it's a belt you wear it you can go to backawarebelt.com, get on the waiting list, or if you have, you will send you interesting articles and stuff like that, and you can kind of see it for yourself. But that's the idea, and I'm just hoping to God this latest version now, they just the new app has to be developed, but I am putting so much money into this to try and make it work. But I really believe in it. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I hope, hope. It's funny, though, because I want it right. It's like constantly investing, but it's like people might think this is a terrible idea. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's like it's not the way to do it if you're any way of a businessman i'm sure there's a better way but it's like i just believe in it so we'll see how it goes you sold on the concept so you believe in the concept then you know you're not so involved in the financial viability of it i guess i just no i just like we're we're fine you know because like i lecture as well so i'm okay for money and my wife has a good job so but sometimes she's like why are you doing this i mean just putting so much time and effort into it but you know if you Mm -hmm. just believe in it i feel like this is something that like i could have seen with like fitbit had it done or something and i'd always be telling people like i had that idea like legit you know and they'd be like yeah sure you did so i'm like i don't care like you know i'd rather it's like anything i always regret not doing something than doing it even if it doesn't come out well so Mm -hmm. Hmm. And um. And y- you know, you come from an area of expertise. I think because you haven't. You have another book that we're not really talking about today. But maybe you can mention where that came from. It's all about back health. Yeah. Again. So the two things I'm really interested in is is kind of running and that sports injuries, sports Pilates side, and then back pain. Like like I'm a physio. I don't see anyone with shoulder issues or anything like that. I just tell them. To, uh, nobody not, goes not... to the physio for shoulder issues anyway. Oh, well, maybe some, they do. Maybe some they do. people do, and I just tell them I'm not the guy. <laughs> um. So, but like, yeah, leg and yeah, and back. So again, I'd written a lot of articles on back pain, um, because it's it's easier to fix than people realize, and it's just like the amount of I don't know, misinformation there. You know, like people come to me and they're they're like, you know, they've got this one little glute stretch to do. And they're like, oh, I don't know why my back's not better. It's like you, you sit on your ass 10 hours a day and you thought, what, a 30 second back stretch was or glute, glute stretch was going to do what exactly? Um, yeah. So, but if you can understand some of the mechanics, the back is actually very simple. It just, you just don't do the thing that c- causes pain and then literally do the opposite and it can start going right. Because I know you said your friend had surgery and it's sad sometimes I see that so often where if people just, if you get them a little bit earlier, it's just, easily fixed so again secret of healthy spine is exactly the same it's like newspaper articles on 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 all my back newspaper articles it's not as thick as this book but it's like i don't know 50 articles on back pain something like that you can get that okay. at backawarebelt.com slash back book 
Okay. So, and, and so um, you, do you deal with people that have uh, like herniated discs or sciatic pain or, yeah. um, or all of the above, basically? Yeah. And sometimes if your back, if your back pain is worse in the morning, it's most likely like a disc irritation. If it's okay. sore, like if you're sore sitting, sore flexing, um, you know, sneezing. Key things you want to do there is power walk, like swinging your arms. Basically, there's a cross chain from like your glutes up to your shoulder both ways. So if you're power walking for like five minutes in the morning, the also other thing is like if it's a disc herniation, the first hour in the morning is like super important. If you can imagine, because you're lying down, the discs like take on extra fluid at night. When we're standing, they kind of get like like pushed out of that, you know. So when when the disc has extra fluid in it in the morning, you have to be super careful because it's like if a if a bottle is full, any press on that bottle, it's going to like kind of spray, which mm-hmm. essentially is what the herniation mm-hmm. is. It's kind of popping out a little bit. Yeah. So what you want to do is like lying on your stomach, doing extensions, like kind of press ups, but keeping your hips on the ground. So to arch your back like 10 times power walking. If I'm having my oatmeal, we, we call it porridge here as Alan would know. Um, if I'm having my oatmeal in the microwave, I'm power walking from my door to the microwave for like the minute or two minutes that that is occurring and then if you're having to sit you've got to take like micro breaks like if you for every hour sitting you need to stand for one minute what you can do as well is like go to the edge of your chair come to the edge drop one leg down so you're kind of in a hip flexor stretch and hold that position then for like two minutes and then switch sides so like you're not sitting and rounding at your back And it's just about like being aware of what causes problems. A lot of people can have problems like Monday morning. But if you ask them on Sunday, like I was the same. Yeah, I was like, God, yeah, my back's a bit sore there. But it's like on Sundays, that's when we watch a lot of like TV shows. So I'm like just sitting on the slouching on the couch. So lying down on the couch rather than slouching, it just took that pain away. So, um, you know, yeah, yeah. And then then, as you said, just doing like your your kind of. Oh, that, should be good. Of... that should be good at the weekend. Uh, dear, said to my get wife, off, dear, get can off you the get off the couch? <laughs> uh, have to get, have to get fully stretched on the couch. Owen, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Said, Owen said it's bad for my back if I uh, you sit on the there. sofa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but these um, are the these yeah. are the these are the kind of we're talking about backs now. But these are the kind of lifestyle things, which in your getting to the start line for running, you start with where well, you're starting about you you're talking about lifestyle. And yes. having having a lifestyle that that's sensible and that, that supports what you're going to try to do, um, in in particular, the my favorite one is about sleep. Um, oh, brilliant! Yeah, I love that one. That's uh, my favorite. Alan loves yeah. that one because uh, the other day he had a nap in between his two workouts, and so um, yes, he loves any reason to go have a nap in between workouts. We, I love a nap. <laughs> we were just talking beforehand, like. Uh, my life my day is successful if i've trained and then i've had a nap if mm-hmm. i have a nap in the day i feel like naps are so undervalued as well just as a mm-hmm. side that even look i, I not know everyone can get it but you do one mm-hmm. one key thing with a nap just before we go on to like the because there is a thing on napping the importance of a nap what people say i don't nap because i won't fall asleep that is not the goal of the nap okay if you're like alan and retired uh-huh. you like you might mm-hmm. You might fall asleep because you are a bit more chilled. But say for you, Liz, okay, you're a nurse, you're going, going, then it's come back here, it's get the podcast up. You know, if we have, like, when people have, like, you know, dinner together, like, kids to get on, everything is, like, up go, regulation. Go, go. Yeah, go, for, go, for go. me, for me, like, I don't nap, like, systematically every day because, like, I'm not tired every day. Like, my eyes are not closing and I feel like, I need to have that feeling where my eyes are kind of closing and then I'll go in the bedroom and I'll be like, you know, falling asleep. Um, But yeah, otherwise, if I'm not like in that state, like I'm not going to nap. But basically, I guess I should because the point is not necessarily sleeping. Exactly. It's down regulating the system because a lot of us then, even in our break, you know, people would laugh. I remember I was doing a talk and this was like mid, I was down in another place in Ireland. I was like testing loads of people for my PhD. And I said, I do a talk because I knew the people down there. So I said, so I was basically doing a talk at like eight o'clock that day. Now I still had had like a 20 minute nap. And I remember, or no, maybe even 30 minutes. And I remember 
kind of telling people about the nap and you could kind of see smirks like god lucky for him and i'm like here yeah. nobody has worked harder here i'm like at the yeah. end of a 13 hour day and i'm give, doing this one hour talk and i just said like okay well i can eat my my pita breads or my sandwiches within like five ten minutes you know and then i'm not on my phone scrolling because the phone is very upregulating as well. It's scroll, it's scroll. It's like not letting your brain settle down. So the idea is not to sleep a lot of times. The idea is to go down regulate, closing your eyes. The intention of trying to sleep for 20 minutes allows the brain to essentially reset. So it's not like, you know, like resetting the computer is the best thing, but at least if you're putting the computer onto sleep for a little while. Mm-hmm. you know start back up you won't feel much different but it's like it stopped the upregulation and allows you to kind of come back down okay yeah because i was gonna say that like your um the the amount of napping you suggest like i think it was 20 or 30 minutes and you yeah. just said 30 minutes but you know when i nap it ends up being like an hour or two so <laughs> no no you can't do that <laughs> so yeah. i don't i don't nap often but when i do i'm a champ at it like yeah, you go hard. <laughs> usually you say You say like 45 minutes is like the ideal time. If you were going to do like, I would set the alarm. Like now probably it takes you a while to get sleep. So if you go for two, it's not crazy. Like 90 minutes circadian rhythms. The other things with napping, just make sure you're trying to get it finished by like, you know, like two, depending on what time you go to bed at, like two that you're up maybe um you know we're not trying to nap at like five and then get back to sleep oh at no like yeah half ten yeah. that i try to always be finished my nap by two o'clock in the day um yeah so that would be another little tip yeah so alan no late naps yeah and i guess i guess the take home message there is it's not trying to get a little sleep it's trying to get a little downtime yes Just yes take, off take, the the stimu- take the stimulus off yeah and it's almost like sort of well it could be meditation almost that that's like, uh, it's you, exactly you're, you're, you're trying to out. hit the same thing like yeah. putting on a meditation is fine it's like trying to just get i know myself it's like you can hear by the way i talk sometimes if i get excited i go too quick it's yeah. all go so it's like and even sometimes honestly it's like i go into bed for a nap or i'll go out to my car if i'm working i'll just put down back to seat and it's like it can take me five ten minutes to actually just literally like the phone is like glued to my hand i mm. i just like oh, one more video one more thing check this it's like throw it away and then it can take 10 minutes of me going i want to check that phone i want to check that phone but yeah. i'm just focusing on my so breath just purging, or that. purging that and then the next 10 minutes i'm like oh i am actually quite tired and like you know and then the alarm goes and I, mm. i'm a little bit groggy but i just keep going and then all of a sudden it's like okay well at least i give my brain that time cool I know, um, I know napping is something that uh, elite athletes do a lot because I follow some of them on uh, social media. And so, uh, you know, like I know like the triathlete in the US, Gwen Jorgensen, she does lots of napping, but yeah. um, you actually wrote a s- few articles or an article about other things that elite athletes do that we should be doing also. I don't know if you want to uh, yeah, go over some some things that like maybe are neglected by us. Uh, that we should pay more attention to so that our running can be faster. Yeah, exactly. Like Paul, Paul Radcliffe used to nap or sleep 16 hours out of a day, which is crazy. Yeah, um, that's impressive. Yeah. That's yeah. that's so, like next level napping. That's like, that like, that's like you need an eight hour night and a four hour nap. Like <laughs> I know that's crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think, as I said, I think, you know, there's a great line, success leaves clues. If you... And that's even for training and everything. If you see someone doing well, while it mightn't be exactly what to follow, they're doing something right, you know. Um, so the ones I had that I wrote this when I used to go on like training trips, like you said, with much better runners than me and just observing what people do. So good nutrition is key was the first one. Like the main difference from talking to elite athletes who stay healthy and consistent over the years compared to ones who pick up regular infections or colds is you know, they have vegetables in nearly every meal. Sweets and treats are kept to a minimum. Now, they would have it maybe on a Sunday, but, you know, it's it's not. The other thing as well is sometimes the problem with sweets and treats isn't even the sweets and treats themselves per se. It's what they stop you eating. If you have a takeaway, mm-hmm. you're not yeah. like steaming up some veg to have it on yeah. the side. And if you did, right. you'd be fine. 
It's it. Mm. So it's you need your nutrition for all those micronutrients as well as the macronutrients. You need the you know for your vitamins, your minerals, and you get them from your fruits and and particularly your vegetables. So. So it's not a question. It's not a question of like, oh, well, we shouldn't have a lot of junk food because like we're going to we're going to gain weight. It's more, it's well, I mean, yes, I guess it's that. But it's also that, well, you need to have all the all the nutrients from all the good food. And if you're eating the junk food, you're not going to have room for the good food. Exactly. You're not in the, you're not inclined to eat those. Yeah. So mm-hmm. to be fair, they actually don't, especially elite athletes, they're, they're burning so many calories and really the calories isn't that big a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the making sure that you're getting good food. They'd have, you could have your multivitamin tablets, but like in an orange, for example, there's 50 micronutrients. So just thinking, oh, I'm going to have one of these tablets that has 20 times the vitamin C of an orange. It's like, you don't know how the other 49 micronutrients mm. interact with the vitamin C in an orange to make that vitamin C work better. You know, so it's like making That's sure true. we can't we can't um, just supplement that. It's like getting in a lot of veg. People, if you see my dinners, it's like it is crazy. It's crazy how much veg you it's like a kilo of carrots, two or three peppers, a red onion. It's like at least four or five things every every dinner, and I think it's needed. Second, we kind of talked about already. I know we um, we could talk about the the habits that they have because I I cut across getting too excited about uh, napping, but they yeah. sleep a lot. You know, regular going to bed at the exact same time, good sleep hygiene. Like everyone goes to sleep and they sleep a lot. They nap, they sleep. They know how important that is for recovery. Then this one kind of linked to that is routine is crucial. So. They don't have jobs, so it is easier, but they go to bed at roughly the same time. They wake up at roughly the same time. They eat regularly. They work and relax at set times. So why is that important? If you're training your body to respond the way you want, you need to have routine. So you can't expect to fall into a deep sleep at half 10. If you're going to sleep at one or two or three, it's going to be like, well, I never go to sleep mm-hmm. at last time. So it takes about 21 days to get used to a habit, you know, to get used to healthier foods or not to crave it. So It's just the importance of getting that consistency as much as you can. Like for some people, they need to set an alarm at nighttime, you know, because I know myself, a paradox is the wrong word, but what I don't know what the word I'm looking for. So I'll just say what I'm I'm thinking in here is as you're getting more tired, it's actually harder to get off the sofa because you're getting tired. So you get lazy. So then it's easier to watch TV, you know, where Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. setting an alarm because you think can think, oh, yeah, it's eight o'clock now. I'll watch. I watch TV for like, say, 90 minutes, half nine, I'll, I'll start getting ready to go to bed. I'll be in bed for like about 10 o'clock, maybe a little bit before it, I'll read my book. But as you're getting, as like, say, it's getting to 20 past nine, half nine, if you don't have an alarm set or you don't have that discipline, you're watching something and you're getting tired, you're getting comfortable on the couch. There's inertia to try actually get off the sofa now. So mm-hmm. making sure that like, if you find, oh, I'll go to bed at random times, set an alarm for yourself to get used to that. And then always number four. So it was nutrition, good sleep, routine. And then the last one they all do is like hard days are followed by easy days. Okay, they don't go hard, hard, hard. That's that's a myth. They always have like, if you have an intense day, they go, they go the next day's easy. So they're kind of managing their energy. And then how does that relate to normal life? Like if you have a lot on, a great deal of stress at work, then try plan a down day on the weekend to recover. You can't burn the candle at both ends. There's only one pot of energy. Like mm-hmm. that idea of like with the candle, it's not you have two separate candles. If you're stressed in work, that is a hard day. You can't then like say, say if you can't get out to, get, get out for your run because work has been crazy, everything's going on. The next day has to be easy because you've had a hard day. You know, it can't go, yeah, okay, okay, now I'm going to, now I'm going to go, do a ridiculously higher running session. Um, you know, you'd have to wait the following day to go, okay, I have easy day and now I can do my my hard workout. Yeah, that's um that's interesting. I um I coach an athlete and um she's a teacher and in the last year she just like wasn't really thriving in in workouts and in training. Um and so I proposed to only have one hard day a week instead of two. Yeah. 
And of course, you know, us runners, like we're all the same. We all like don't yeah. want to downgrade our, we see this downgrade to our training. Um, but I think like after a few weeks, like she was actually, she saw the benefit. 100%. Because she just was like she, you know, she would have this these, these cycles where she would she would be she'd be training really consistently, and all of a sudden she was sick. So it's like, yes. yeah. So and and it was like pretty cyclical because every like three months or so she was sick or she had something or or was like had a twinge here or like a hamstring like a strain or something. And um, yeah, and I, I just was you know because you know here I am like looking at all the mileage, making sure the workouts are like, you know, kind of appropriate for her races and stuff. But like, she just wasn't, you know, she just wasn't feeling great. uh, Most of the time, I think. And, but you know, obviously would push through and like, I used to do the same. So it's not like, you know, we're all all as runners, like we're kind of all the same. We all just want to be fit. And we figure like, well, we have to run fast to run fast in races. And that's true. But maybe sometimes we don't have to run fast as often as we think we do if like there are other things also in the way. And that doesn't mean that she reduced the number of days of running. It's really just the number of hard runs. So still running the same amount of days, just not two hard runs plus a long run. Now it's only one hard run plus a long run. So yeah, exactly. And she's going to get way better results, get consistent with that and then see, can we add something back in or Mm -hmm. that energy is so important. And it's like I said, people don't, don't think about that enough. So that's really well done. Yeah. And, and when, um, you know, when we look at it, it's like, like every time she's sick, it's always like in a high stress period because teachers have cycles in their year, you know, they've got the, you know, the, the, the midterm, the first test, and then they have to do grading. And then at the end of the year, well, I think the students are just more, um, like harder to control and stuff because it's the excitement of like the, 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 the summer vacation and everything. And plus they have all the final exams and everything. So everybody's stressed and the teachers are stressed because they have all the correcting and, um, and all the, all the report cards and all these other things. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely a valid point to that, that, you know, since we're not elite athletes, sometimes we just need to, um, rethink, our training a little bit yeah and yeah. a lot of times you get better results doing that like we had a guy and um he was on night shifts but he did the same oh, training wow. both weeks you know it's like no man he's like do one or no workouts on the week on the four or five days that you're on nights and then the next week we can do three workouts it'll work out better than just doing two and two you know mm-hmm i used to work night shift and i remember like it, it seemed like even though you feel energetic during the day because it's daylight it's like your legs are always heavy they're always yeah. heavy like every single run they're just heavy well yeah. i guess i guess you know um a typical example is me in taking retirement um after i took retirement suddenly my running started to go up yeah because um, you have extra time more energy yeah yeah so it's just a whole load of stress that i wasn't probably recognizing because it's just background stress and people say, oh, You're are you stressed at work? You go, nah, not, yeah, not a little so bit, much. but no. Yeah, exactly. It's what it is. But then when you haven't got that, um, it has you know, a significant effect on your ability to train well. So now I'm a pro athlete. I'm seeing the benefits. Yeah. One, one of the things I read in your book um, with, with some degree of detail, there was a section, I think, about um, marathon training tips. And because Liz and I are both in heavy marathon training programs at the moment i thought oh, i'll read this and some with some attention and, with a and fine in, tooth comb like this <laughs> could be in trouble here got my microscope out <laughs> but an interesting thing one one that i sort of saw and i, I didn't go oh yeah that, that, okay that that makes sense that makes sense that makes sense i went oh this is interesting marathon training tips practice holding yourself back yeah so somewhere somewhere now i'm i'm probably taxing your memory because it's sort of buried in the middle of one article that that, that that you wrote, but you talk about practicing holding yourself back. So how do we do this in for, for marathon training and why should we be doing this? Uh, the main re I'll go with the why, and then we'll talk about the how the, okay. the main reason is that um, I do a lot of stuff on heart rate, uh, but even on the pace of things, 
if we were honest with ourselves, the pace, say if I say go out and do like three by 10 minutes, at, maybe like even say five by 10 minutes at marathon pace. If in that, and I, you have two minutes off, like instinctively, you know, you have only 10 minutes to do with a two minute break. Mm -hmm. If I, if at the end of that 10 minutes, I said, actually, now you're going to do that for three and a half hours, you'd, you'd probably cry, you know, yeah. <laughs> you'd probably break down and say, yeah. I can't do it. Complain. So, you know, especially just, at Alan's pace, because sometimes he likes yeah. to uh, push the envelope a little that's, bit. That's what I mean. Like a lot of us <laughs> and as well, like a lot of times the pace you're picking is and this is is arbitrary. It's like you haven't run that pace, you know, like you want to run mm. this PV. So you're running you're running mm -hmm. a pace that you've actually never run. And you're you picked a time that even like so say you've run three hours 30 for <laughs> I shouldn't have picked a person. No, we'll give you the, we'll us. give you the numbers. So I'll give you Liz's yeah. I'll give you Liz's numbers because they're more interesting. Mm. Um, Liz has a I've PR. Run... Liz has a PR of three oh four something. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. three oh four. And, and she wants like, to run under three hours. Thirty. So she yeah. has a three hour training pace that she's got to be able to hit for three hours at some some stage. Yeah, but that's exactly right. Right. So, so it's eight seconds a K, basically, which like seems like oh, that's not a lot, but it actually feels like a lot sometimes. <laughs> It, but it will feel like a lot in training is so like say yeah. like three or four to three minutes is, or a three hour marathon is is not a lot now you are it's a very good time so but but realistically when you ran the three or four you were tapered you were recovered everything had done well to be ready for that now if you do that again there's no reason why you can't run say 259 or or, or whatever break the three hours but what i'm saying is when people then go out that's not the same as in the middle of a heavy block trying to hit that time. Trying to hit mm. three, like a three hour pace in 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 a heavy block of training is probably equivalent of on the day trying to run a two forty five. It, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, and it does make sense. So you know, because my five k brain, because you know, like I trained for a long time for track events and shorter events, like top five k, ten k, and that's what you do. You know, you take the distance, you break it up into four hundreds. So you go and you do like twelve four hundreds of five k pace, and then like if you have if your goal is to run a personal best, I mean, this is how we were training. You know, when I was. Um, uh, running with the university cross country team, but you know, you, yeah. you break down your goal into, into what you need to run over 400. And so you would start practicing that pace, like maybe, I don't know, eight months out from like outdoor season. So you start really early, but you start with doing 200s of like this goal 5k pace, not your actual 5k pace. Um, yeah. And then you kind of hope that you piece it together by race day, like sometime eight months later. And um that doesn't seem to work in marathon training at all because all of the personal bests I've had in the marathon have been complete surprises. Usually after I've missed half the training. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so like this whole marathon is just like this, this kind of strange distance that I have a hard time knowing how to train for other than like I know you need lots of kilometers like you need to run a lot because that's the basics yeah you do but, yeah but I mean then like for example like the type of speed workouts and then and then also this marathon pace practice marathon pace I mean it feels in workouts insanely I mean, hard yeah that's, Alan, it's too hard yeah, Alan doesn't always seem to seem to feel the effect that I feel, but like I'm running marathon pace sometimes and I, I feel like it's more like 10K half marathon yeah. pace. Um, exactly. There's four, there's four things. There is four things. Now, as I said, I would recommend everyone gets like a lactic test and then just do it off your lap, do it off your like marathon heart rate because that'll do it on effort even, but even if we were just doing it off the paces, running slower or running a bit more controlled will mimic what the marathon will feel like when the adrenaline is going when the legs are fresher way more than thinking you need to hit this time so like you do still need mm -hmm. you still need in your week like <laughs> this is the way i do for a marathon right if i when we do like sample trainings for people there's four things they need over a two-week cycle you need kind of one session per week of like or every four weeks of like a 5k 10k type stimulus now you might include that with like so i would do maybe like 10 minutes at like marathon and slower than marathon but marathon 
effort, then eight by one minute on, one minute off. Or it could be 15 minutes at marathon pace, take two minutes easy jog. Uh, two by five minutes at like lactic threshold pace, um, which essentially would be like our kind of 10K. 15K pace. 15K pace mm-hmm. is ideal, yeah. yeah. And then six by one minute on, one minute off. So we're getting, what that's going to do and then doing some strides, what that's going to do is the marathon pace then, the actual physical running doesn't feel that fast because you still have kept some kind of speed in your legs. But relative, still like 5K, 10K. Not And again, when we're doing 5K, 10K effort, think, could I hold this for 15 to 30 minutes? It's not a sprint. People are doing it like, like the end of a race when they're digging in. Think of it like after that initial start, but when you settle into the race, that's the pace mm-hmm. you should be kind of, that's the feel. It's the same mm-hmm. in a marathon. Feel it like if you were into like the three mile, four mile, you're not like gotten, you're trying to relax. That's the thing you need to practice. So you have your mm-hmm. 5K, 10K work. Then you need, the second thing you need is um, a kind of thresholdy work, like really building the aerobic base. So that like, marathon pace to threshold pace i do it on the heart rate and lactic you really need that work that's going to build the aerobic system and that's the main okay. thing because it's like 99 percent aerobic the next thing you need is doing marathon effort not the pace so for you liz it would be like 3 310 315 is going to stimulate what it's going to feel like at three i guarantee i guarantee yeah. if two weeks beforehand you did you did a session at like 310 315 it's going to feel exactly like the three hours if i if i took two pictures of it that's kind of yeah. what we're doing isn't it liz that's ideal running on marathon paces at 310 pace and it feels yeah. like effort wise it feels like a three-hour marathon or worse yeah so yeah. doing 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 some runs like so in your longer runs so i'd have like say if you did it on wednesday the saturday long run then of that one week could be like 40 minutes just very easy then do like 10 minutes at like that marathon pace five minutes back to steady not like totally jogging but just easy pace and doing that for like say 45 minutes like 10 minutes on five minutes easy 10 minutes on five minutes easy 10 minutes on five minutes easy and then finish off the rest of it as an easy run but getting used to when you're when your legs are kind of tired running at the effort okay then the fourth thing is time on your feet, but a lot of time people can just over, especially people like non elite runners, they overly, they overly think just doing time on your feet is the thing. And it's not, it's that's needed because you need to practice your fueling. You need to know what it's like to be out for three hours. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing a four hour marathon, I always cap the long run at three hours. It's going to be detrimental after that. Even if I'm going to run a five hour, just do three hours, leave it at that. Yeah, so when I'm saying hold back, it's like people have a tendency to nearly go faster or push because the reps aren't as long. And what they need to practice is like imagining their, and this is the how, imagine you're like three miles in or for every rep you're doing, think think double, even though you're not going to do double. So if you're doing 10 minute reps, think, okay, if I had a 20 minute rep, would I be running this fast at five minutes in? And that mm-hmm. goes for 5K as well. If I had a, I w- if I had two minutes of this pace, would I be running as fast here? Because sometimes we're just gutting it through because we know it's only a re- minute, but it's not then replicating mm-hmm. the effort that we need. Like I did a 5K, literally it's a park run. I'm over here yeah. and I was practicing on the course and I was doing it at lactic threshold pace just to get used to seeing what it was like. So I did lactic threshold, like five minutes. So I was going through my lactic threshold. I was probably a little bit faster than I should have, but I was doing it in like 307K. I, I remember going through. I was like, oh, okay. And that's like five minute miling. It, the, literally the next week, I was like, okay, I would have started quick. But then I was like, oh yeah, get into that pace. It felt the exact same. And I was through in like 244. You know, it's like 20 seconds quicker a K. And it felt, I was like, oh my God, that felt like exactly how the last one felt. Wow. But it's like, I've just rested. I've like, I've taken caffeine. I have my shoe, my good shoes on. I'm like ready to roll. Okay. You know, so if Never I went out. underestimate the shoes and the caffeine. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're so good. If, you don't, if you're getting ready for a marathon and you don't have a pair of like vapor flies, buy them straight away. Um, don't just, worry. 
I yeah. just I did that. I just yeah. I don't that. think anyone has it, but if you do, like you <laughs> cannot go into a race now without those. We've kind of decided on uh, Saucony and Dolphin Elites for. Oh, they're lovely the as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, we just yeah, really broke. Nice. We just broke the piggy bank and got all the coins out. And <laughs> it's just it's both so went worth and it. Like, those. You can't like you're at such a disadvantage if you just have normal yeah. shoes without a carbon fiber plate. Like you gotta, without, you gotta without go without the bouncy foam. Yeah, without the bouncy foam, you gotta go. Listen, Christmas is coming early for me. It's coming <laughs> in August. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll keep the box. I'm gonna put these battered shoes back in. I'm gonna wrap them up <laughs> yeah, on the day. But I need these shoes the for the race. Like. Uh, I won't complain, I tell you. Oh my gosh, yeah, okay. I know. So I guess um, kind of related is um, you mentioned in the book that interval running is the single best form of running activity you can do. So is that <laughs> phrase geared I, I towards... <laughs> geared towards like maybe people that don't um like i i I don't know i wonder if you were talking to um people that don't maybe haven't seen the benefit of interval running and like they i don't know they picked up running one pace pace runners yeah one pace runners you see this i i write some articles for like running magazine so i can go specific but then others are just like local like just general population and what i find is a lot of them they have a 5k route. Like they literally just go out and run the same route Mm -hmm. all the time. Same Mm -hmm. pace as Alan said, one pace running. And for that person, I'm trying to say like, oh look, every second day, even if it's the same route, just like do fart click on it. Do, you know, as we were saying, like five minutes at 80% and then jog two minutes, five minutes at 80%, you know, change. Even if if you do nothing, because people are just used to doing the, the their route. 5k route yeah their 5k yeah. it's like chain add intervals into this that will take yeah. no no longer time it'll make it more exciting and like the body stops ad- adapting like if so that's where people sometimes they start running they're doing their like say 5k loop and they're getting fitter and all of a sudden like the weight's not coming off as much as it did anymore because they're plateauing because the body has now adapted to that stress so you need yeah. to kind of constantly um constantly adjust the stress so that's that was where that article was this is great the, uh, like some of these articles i wrote about like 10 years ago so it's great to go back <laughs> every lane. You know, if you okay. go writing it down uh you will be held accountable that's how yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um so now this is something more and more uh i guess relevant to me uh because i've had several of these um poor races so uh, what are some tips to dealing with a poor race? Because, um, you know, historically in the marathon, I mean, the marathon is hard because you can only do one every six months. And so hard. then, you know, you end up like, uh, and, you know, even if let's say you end up doing, I don't know, out of like you get one good one out of four. I mean, for a normal race, that wouldn't be a bad average, you know, yeah. it means that every two months you have a good race, uh, which is, which is pretty good. Like I'll take that. But in the marathon, it means like, that's like, that could be like two, three, four years. I don't know. Any, any, any tips with, with dealing with that? I've always, um, I think, I don't remember who told me this, but someone told me in the past that, I can be disappointed. Maybe I read it in one of the books we read, but I'm allowed to be disappointed, but I have to put a time limit on it. So that's kind of been my strategy. I might have told you that. No, but I didn't know, but I did it before, like before I was part of um, our running club. Like it's been kind of, that's like the only, that's like the one thing that I've always um, sort of known is that you're like allowed to cry after your race, oh, no, but no, like no. you shouldn't cry for a month. Like you've we got to put about a limit like, on it. Was it, you get a one day, one week pity party. Yes. After that. Yeah. That was like last marathon. I had one week pity party. I was allowed one week. Alan yeah, said yeah. it was okay. He let me cry on his shoulder after the race. <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely, because it is annoying. You put a lot of work in. Mm-hmm. So I think I think it's not like just ignore that. That's so true. I think though you do get a lot out of it, you know. So even like that, if the marathon didn't go well, you need you need also to see like some positives. Like both like isn't it great to be like fit and healthy, but also like true running. Okay, the marathon didn't go well, but you had some really good training built up to that. So okay, you can't do another mm-hmm. marathon, but you have a really good aerobic base now. Mm-hmm. Let 
let your body recover for like two weeks, build into maybe like some 10K type training, add that little bit of like speed, don't, and that'll come up to the second point, which we'll talk about. Don't overdo it. Let the body absorb the training. Maybe it just was a bit overcooked. Let the body absorb. And you could be running PBs over 10K and talking about, you know, I had a terrible marathon, but I actually, you know, there's a lot of positives that can come even in negative races. You know, it's like, or like, even if it's like, look, I learned how to hurt there because halfway through it was terrible, but I kept going and I finished, which is like, that's great because there's going to be a time where you're going to feel good at halfway and you're going to have to kind of push, but the time's going to be way better, you know? So I think there is things to like, there's always some good in a race that you can, if you, if you were like, allow yourself to feel bad about the race, but also think, okay, I feel crap because that the performance didn't go, but there are one or two things here that went well. Um, the second thing is so, so important. And this happened to a guy, um, I won't say his name, but a very elite runner here. He, I've heard not say it anymore because I'll give it away who it is. <laughs> if people listen to this, I don't think they'll listen to this, uh, um, you know, on this side here, but um, I'll be putting it out into my group. So maybe he will. Yeah. Um, he had a bad race and then, but he was in good shape. And then in the training, the, in the week, he, he needed to prove he was in good shape. So then he ran ridiculously hard for like an 800 meters. He ran a really fast time. And then the next race, he ran poor again. And I see that so often. People, you know, when, when you run well, you, you, you know you're in good shape, so you don't prove it. So you actually pull back the training. You're like, oh, I'm in good shape mm-hmm. now. I don't need to do any more. You're a bit more relaxed. You're probably like going a bit more conservatively in training because you're like, look, I've just run well there. There's no point overdoing it. And then that allows you to run well again the next week or the next time you're out. Yeah. Where if you run poorly, out of frustration a lot of times and to prove that you're in better shape, you run hard. Like maybe you're meant to have an easy run, an mm-hmm. easy long run, say after a 5K or 10K and you run it really hard and then you're more in the hole. So even if you run poorly, you need to treat it like you ran well. And I know it's hard. You can be upset, but you need to be objective. Like, okay, mm-hmm. if I ran well, you know, even if it's a case of like, say if Alan's run well and Liz hasn't, ask Alan, like, what are you doing? Like, force yourself to go easier. Because when you run well, you go easy because you're not looking for anything. Mm-hmm. And when you run when you run poorly, you tend to like to prove you're either in good shape or to prove that you're not like mentally weak. You, you over, overdo it. So you know, um, I think I think taking your rest and thinking, what would I do if I did well? Well, I might take an easy time and then build back into it. And all of a sudden, those 5K or 10K, if you had a, had a marathon, you'll do um, do quite well. If it's then, if there's like prolonged, say if you, Liz, if you had like several poor marathons, there could be something wrong with the, in your training. Everyone like, I have, there's some great coaches who for some runners doesn't work great. And then they go to someone else and works great. And then that other coach might have this guy that it doesn't well, but go well. And he goes to mm-hmm. coach A and he flies. It's good sometimes to get a second opinion on things. If it's a thing that's been going for a while. And sometimes it can be just to say, yeah, look, you're doing the right things. Like say with a marathon, that does happen. Things have to be mm-hmm. right on the day. It's like just this one crescendo to a day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think marathon for me is a bit of a weak spot because like, you know, I had, I had another coach before and it was the same, like I was with him for, for a long time. And my other, my other distances, they improved and my marathon, it was like so stagnant. Um, and then well, I switched teams to Alan's, uh, the same one as Alan is, uh, running with. And so I did their training and again, it's like hit or hit or miss, you know, a little bit. Yeah. And now we're a little bit, we're following a program. This is like the third marathon. I think we're following the program in the advanced marathon book, but, okay. um, but we've been putting different spins on it each time. And this year the spin is more like, okay, let's train at the marathon pace that we think we're at and not the marathon pace we want to be at. So That's we've perfect. kind of taken a bit of a, like, I guess, 
you know, when you were talking about those paces earlier, uh, that's, that's exactly what we're doing. So yeah, with yeah. the marathon, it's, um, but it's a valid point. Like sometimes like, a like one coach's philosophy just doesn't work for you. Yeah. But in this case, it's like, well, if you take the advanced marathon book written by Pete Bitzinger, like that's a coach as well. So like, I've had like three coaches yeah. now for the marathon and like, I don't just, I just don't do well in the marathon. Like, But it could marathon. be as well, like, to be fair, it could be that you're more of a 5k, 10k runner. Like if you would did that in track and like, that's the way I am. Like mm -hmm. I've ran, I've ran say 49 minutes for 10 miles, but we're at the limit now we're at the limit of where I'll go, you know, so I can talk about what. Yeah to do well for a marathon but it's yeah. like that's not my i i it's not why you run and i'm not good at that do you know what yeah. i'm, yeah. I'm built more for like 1500s 5ks i can get away with a good 10k i can kind of get away with a good 10 mile but it's going to be really hit and miss and if we go above that it's going to be more bad days yeah. than good days so it could be a thing of okay maybe do one marathon in the year and then have a nice like 5k 10k yeah. season yeah and then as i said if you ever even chat after this, I um maybe after this marathon, if you want to try a different way, I do like lactic testing. We can try look for someone in Montreal, um, and I can work it out, and I give you like free training to try. I'd love to see how you get on with it. That would be, be very cool. That's another that's another avenue. However, no. by by the time we get to October, you will have the three hour the, the sub three hour marathon, and this will all be yes. a, an academic conversation. <laughs> exactly. Even then, you might want to try something different. And then, as I said, look. If poor performance persists, get your bloods checked. If it is something that you're feeling really run down. And then lastly, just know like poor performances are part of the course. There is a good line, like don't let the successes go to your head and the losses go to your heart. Like that is running. You know, I've That's had. Really nice. Yeah. Like even, even this year, I've had some really good, like I've won, won a lot of races on this kind of national road racing scene. So a lot of people are saying, oh God, well done. You've, done great this year haven't you and I, I know currently i've gone onto the track and i've ran terribly like i've gone to belfast which is the other so i've driven like five hours twice like in the space of three or four weeks thinking i'm going to run really well and ran terribly so oh. it's mm -hmm. just it's just the way yeah. it goes you know you have the ups mm -hmm. and you have the downs unfortunately also there's i think there's 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 a mentality and there's a an internal dialogue approach as well because you can do a run that doesn't meet your A goal and you go, that was a poor run. Actually, maybe it wasn't. But if you put it back into a different context, maybe it was a good run. It just wasn't as good as you would have dreamed. You know, maybe it's yeah, a B, exactly. Maybe it's not an A plus 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 plus, but it's an A plus. You know, it's not a D run. It's a it's an A plus run. Um, I think that's so and it, you get that a lot when it's round numbers. So say yeah. if Liz runs like Exactly. Three yeah. or one, or someone runs four or yeah. one, they're they're like not or four or five, yeah. but if it's like a PB or maybe you have a very good PB as it is, and you get within like, say even for a ten k, you get within like a minute of that. It's like, well, that's still a good run. You're getting close mm. to that shape, or as you said, maybe it's like I'm getting very consistent at this same pace, and that mm -hmm. kind of lends itself to a big breakthrough in the future. So yeah, that's so true, Alan. The way you look at it. Yeah, I I know I would be very disappointed if I got three hours and zero one seconds that would be very yeah. disappointing <laughs> before before i ran 1358 i ran like 1400.12 oh like, <laughs> oh jesus yeah yeah, yeah. You got slit your wrist <laughs> i know it's just like i know again it was like that it was a big pb and it was just like oh my god I, I was yeah. like, like, you know, like, time, was I, like couldn't have, you sprint? I couldn't have like ducked a little faster. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. I know. Honestly, the amount but of isn't it, thinking, isn't it crazy? Because like, that's such a, that's a fantastic, run. that's a, such a fantastic <laughs> yeah. run. You were, you were probably like, what's wrong with me? I, I couldn't was get fuming. That like, I was fuming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I ran, I ran, I ran under three hours by, by 11 seconds last year. So, oh, I, got, that's so I, sweet. I got under by 11 seconds. But for the last three kilometers, I was, I was running just based on pure fear because yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah. I'm going to finish in three hours, zero something. <laughs> it's going to be three hours, zero, four seconds or something. I'm going yeah, to, yeah, yeah. This might be my only chance ever because I'm not getting any younger. And uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. It's so such I was a great just, feeling. I just, that was a, it was a huge relief rather than a, an elation. Um, that is but true. Anyway. A lot of times it is relief. Yeah. My friend was Isn't for that years. Funny? Yeah, it's so funny. Like, the her 
it hurts so much worse than it actually you know you enjoy it for a little bit but when mm-hmm. you it's like an obsession and once you have it it's like it's gone you know mm-hmm. as opposed so, to you think oh it's great so actually um alan just uh, had a great segue into um because you know he's a master's athlete so uh, i mean we're we're all three of us are master's athletes but the well you're maybe younger than um, than we are but what's yeah, some different? are more mastered than the others yeah. <laughs> some, some of them have mastered being master <laughs> um uh i'm i'm kind of an apprentice master and uh, yeah i'm a, same. I'm a yeah. plastic master um, i think <laughs> but uh how do masters athletes how should they adapt their training i mean because we yeah. should all we should still be training kind of the same in terms of like we should still do speed workout out um, oh 100 percent. we should still do lactate thresholds we should still do all the hard stuff but um there's there's some nuance to that right 100 percent. like i think uh key thing is i there isn't probably z- no real 100 percent way of doing well as you get older but there's one way of definitely not doing it and it's trying to replicate what you did in your your 20s as you get older in your 30s your 40s your 50s or 60s that like you you do have less regenerative capacity it's just nature so you've got to you've got to accept that and you were a different athlete like say Liz you would have done track I would have done track I was way more explosive and powerful when I was younger but now I'm actually like physically stronger and way more aerobically strong okay so mm-hmm. I've mm-hmm. like Owen now in in ways is way better than Owen when he was younger and then in other ways yeah he's worse so if i just focused on the things that i was good at i'd be getting way worse Mm -hmm. um so a couple of things i think there's a few things you need to do the first is you need something outside of running and look now this is like if you ask a butcher for diet advice he's going to say (laughs) me so i am a pilates instructor so do take this as a bit of pinch of salt but i genuinely believe this um you need to do something outside of running to restore at least once a week in our we have free trials of the sports Pilates. It's everywhere. I'll do it here. E V E or A or D Pilates, P I L A T E S dot com um, slash sport free trial. Or if you just put up everywhere Pilates dot com, top right hand corner, you'll see a free trial. So you can try it for free. You'd have an idea of the type of exercises that you want to do, but do those then basically, right? So you need to do something that's going to help restore the body. Because as well, when you're a master's athlete, unless you're uh, lucky enough to get be retired early like Alan to you are probably sitting a lot you're working like there's more demands than just you know being being up and about right so you need something to help restore the body especially if you have a desk job before we're going running so once a week you need to be doing sports platters is what I do you might want to do gym you might want to do yoga but something that's going to help prepare the body for running secondly if you're used to doing like three sessions in a week I, I like dropping back down to two, kind of like you were saying with your your um, athlete who was a teacher. It's like it just gives you more time to recover. There's a lot more stresses. So I found like going on Wednesday and going on Saturday or, you know, Tuesday, Friday, some some bigger gap really helps as opposed to going Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday um, for those harder workouts can make a big difference. Also with that, speed work is important, but not not overly focusing on the time that you have to hit just the effort just in intentionally trying to pick it up but not not straining can really help you know because the muscles are a little bit more susceptible to to tears and stuff like that so we just want to the speed work is really important to keep that in but keep it in as strides keep it in as you know your minute intervals um and not like i have to hit 30 seconds for 200 or 40 seconds for 200 because that's what I used to do when I was younger it's just like okay I'm mm-hmm. going to pick it up for 40 seconds and then um, come down and if you're doing those consistently and regularly you'll keep that speed I don't know what other ones I put in there but um, they're the main ones that would come to mind now sometimes people do cross training as well maybe one of the days instead like maybe a cycle or like or swim to recover I don't I don't actually do that one myself I another thing is I at least have one rest day in the week so I'm doing my Pilates one rest day i'm doing two sessions in the week rather than three and i'm running like you know as i said i've run sub 14 i've run sub 30 that exact schedule as opposed to trying to do it exactly as i did it when i was younger all good advice 
I've got my as a professional a professional unpaid athlete. Um, I've got my two gym sessions programmed in. Brilliant, uh, brilliant. So. It's so important, though. It's honestly so important, especially because as we get over the age of sixty five or over thirty five if we're not doing stuff and we lose about 1% of muscle mass a year. So it's just, but we can counteract that a lot, you know, work on mobility and course ability. Use it. Yeah. And then the other thing, as you said, using experience to your advantage, you'll have new strengths like, okay, I'm not as powerful, but I'm more aerobically strong. I've run enough races to know not to go off like a lunatic to yeah. like mm-hmm. build, you know, have yeah. other things that will come. So you can still run really, really well. You just might do it in a slightly different way. Yeah, in the marathon, I think one of the things I, I've come across is is trying to be uh, running with a calm mind. So you're going to be out there for a long time. Don't burn your energy stressing about you know what your pace doing. You know what your pace is doing. It's all good. Just just chill and save all your energy for your legs. Uh, don't so you know things things like that are, are adva- advantages advice. you get all them. Yeah, I try that as well. Even in five k, ten k, try get into that like imagine it was a, a threshold run as quickly as possible. Like, as you said, mm. the sooner you can kind of get back down and just breathe and relax, the better. And especially in those mass uh, participation marathons, there's a lot of people around. So if you can try to get calm in that, it's going to help. Actually, maybe that's the advantage of those mass participation. Cause sometimes like you have no choice, but to run like your first K slow because you're in a, yeah, they're not there. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. you're, in a, you're in a pack. Yeah. So like, you're not yeah. going to move anyway. So you might that's as well thing. not, not not you know stress about that and you just um you kind of write off the first two kilometers because uh they're they're gonna be slower and also you're just warming up as well because for the marathon what i learned with experience because the first time i did a marathon i warmed up for it like a 5k and i learned that you're not supposed to do that because you're just wasting all your energy (laughs) <laughs> how, how long would you warm up for it now seven minutes do a seven minute job like or what like 10 do? 10 minutes i heard yeah, yeah. the last yeah. the last warm-up that i heard was um uh was five minutes jog five minutes at marathon pace um okay is what what i'd heard um and i was like well 10 minutes it doesn't sound too strenuous so i guess i'll do that so i've done that the last couple times yeah i do i just recommend my people to do like seven minutes easy jogging not even marathon base like just really okay. easy jogging and then just do like four maybe 20 second strides oh, at marathon okay. pace okay even like yeah 20 to 30 second strides at marathon pace like stopping for like 10 seconds and then stretch or whatever just to be ready it sounds good you're doing yeah, less, sounds... less effort at marathon pace to get the same mental programming yeah and physical yeah. programming probably mm-hmm. that's Probably one for us for our next warm up, please. Yeah, I think so. Maybe that's five minutes at marathon. Yeah, because five, five minutes at marathon pace is a lot. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. For you, like, that'd be nearly a mile. Like, that'd be getting close to like at least a k a mile of it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, what, it's seven minutes, like, k. Miles? It's like one. Yeah, it ends k. up being like yeah, twelve hundred meters or something. No, something I would like just yeah, yeah. I think I think four by save 30 that seconds. for the marathon because I might yeah. need those twelve hundred meters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I just think seven minutes, seven minutes easy. Um, yeah. and then just do your four by 30 seconds because the great thing there's it's in the book as well is that vo2 kinetics that if you have a stride done even if you have to wait then in the in your in your pen or whatever for that like 10 minutes or 15 because you've opened up the lungs with those kind of longer runs it's very quick for you to go back to that position again you know that's good advice we're gonna try that for our next warm-up yeah brilliant yeah I've got one, I've got one also very specific question um, that ca- that came up in your book um, because there's a lot of debate about the usefulness or non usefulness of static stretching um, yeah. for runners these days. Um, you know, everybody's saying, "Oh, don't bother stretching anymore." You know, it's, uh, if yeah, I didn't know if it, that it, it's good. Great. Yeah, so it's good psychologically, right? but. Um, but you do, you talk about why static stretching in your warm up is not such a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, yeah. And look, I wouldn't if you're not used to doing it. It's not something you need to put into this. Is this was something where I just wanted to highlight because obviously I like with my PhD that there's problem. The problem with research is that there's a lot of researchers who aren't practical, and then the way the research is conducted is not practical. So it's both practical advice on static stretching, but also a thing of just be careful when you read something that study said this, because yeah. they're not telling you how the study was done. Yeah. So the, the, I'll explain the study to you and you're going to, you're going to 
come to the same conclusion. Okay, so the, the way all those studies that say static stretching shouldn't be done in a warm up, it's dynamic stretching should be done because static stretching reduces your power. You would have heard that, I, I assume. Mm -hmm. Something like yep. that, yeah. yeah, we've heard. Okay, yeah. So this is how it's done, right? So we're going to take Alan and Liz, like two runners. Okay, so what they would have done, so how they would have done it is Liz does her, they both, you do a jump on a jump mat and then. Liz does dynamic stretch, does does dynamic stretch and hold for two seconds and then does a jump again and check how much it improves. Alan does a jump and then he has to hold a hamstring, touch his toes for two minutes, then come up and try a jump. We're talking, we just talked about warm-ups before a marathon. In your wildest dreams, Alan, would you two minutes before the start go down and touch your toes for two minutes? Probably not. <laughs> Like, like, I might go down study. intending to come back up, but then not be able to get back up <laughs> <laughs> when they dye your shoes and it just all went wrong. <laughs> but that's, but that's what I mean. When people do static stretching, so I did a study then that was the way it's actually done normally. So what we did was, mm. um, both groups did a little bit of a jog. Well, yeah, both groups then did, uh, did a little bit of a jog. One group then did static stretching and foam rolling, while the other group just this didn't do anything. Then both groups did like dynamic stretching and like strides to potentially or activate the muscles. Yes. And there was actually no difference then in the jump performance of both okay. groups. In yeah. fact, the, the static stretch group slightly ran quicker on sprints, but I don't think that was a major reason. Yeah. But it just, so I always do static stretching. That's why I do my jog. If I was in my 5K, I do a jog. I do my static stretching then, holding for 10 seconds, or I do some foam rolling. Before, If I get out my car, I'll foam roll and I'll the cross ball around my hips to get nice and loose. Then I'll do my jog. Then I'll do some static stretching. Then I'll do like my high knees, bum kicks and side to side. Dynamic drills, yeah. Mm. Dynamic drills. And then I'll do like, as I said, I'll always do at least one 30 second stride at the pace I'm going to run at to get myself okay. breathing heavy. I put on my my shoes that I'm going to race in, yeah. and then I might do like three shorter strides with a walk back just to kind of stay nice and loose, and then I go. Be so when people hear that is a good little lesson. Boat one, if you have mm -hmm. if you include static stretching in yeah. your running, yeah. don't be afraid to keep it in there. But it's more of a more of a warning of be careful when you hear about studies. Because they don't give you the context. A lot of people can't read academic studies. So they yeah. don't know how to read a methodology and yeah. see like, this is, this is in this context, this is what they found. Yeah. They just get the abstract and the abstracts can be highly biased towards what the author wants you to tell. There's a, there's a great line where it's like, there's lies, damn lies, and then statistics. Yes. Because I can make a statistic. Yeah. Like if I want to say something, it's, yeah. If you know how to manipulate it, you can kind of nearly put it in an abstract and know that yeah. a lot of people won't be able to read. Yeah, the, 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 the little saying on right. writing scientific papers, I have a PhD as well. Um, Liz is the Wallowitz of the group. <laughs> yeah. uh, she doesn't have a, a PhD. But the, this um, happens often, though. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, the scientific publication uh, thing that I read said, um, so in the study, 33% uh, of the mice gave a positive response 33% of the mice gave a negative response and the other one escaped before we could test it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The number. Yeah. So true. Or you know yourself, like um, statistically significant. That just means the chances aren't, it's not mm. down to luck. So if yeah. you have a thousand people, the chances of it down to luck are very small. So mm -hmm. people say, oh, it's a significantly significant improvement. But that improvement might be like 0.00001%. It may be yeah. nothing practically. Yeah. But people are like, They'll trump it, whatever they want, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, okay, good, good stuff. It's good to hear the other side of the coin because, you know, you get generally accepted as true, you know, in, in the social media age. Somebody produces an article, somebody reads, one person reads the article, somebody podcasts it, three people take that as gospel, They're, they put it out on their websites, and now it's generally known that this is true, that yes. you can get that social media effect. Yeah, that's um, exact. That's exactly, Alan. That's that's one hundred percent what it was. One just to explain that. Look, static stretching is okay when it's in the right context. And two, just to get people thinking that just because it said, as you said, a study, and then this gets hyped up by a lot of people, it's like that. Do you know the other one? 
I do like sleep, but sometimes there's a paradox of sleep where it's like, um, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast, a rival of your podcast, and um, no, sure, sure. Yeah. um <laughs> it, it's you and him for the top spots. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're exactly comparable. Yeah, yeah. So, but the guy was on talking about the importance of sleep, and because I love sleep, I couldn't sleep that night then because he was talking about all these detrimental performances if you can't sleep. So I was like, look, I got to look up these studies. He was talking, he was talking about this massive reduction in VO2 if you don't sleep well. And this race, perf- I couldn't sleep. I was like, I need to sleep. Oh, I need this no. performance. <laughs> so then I looked up the study. The study that he was quoting was when people flew from like, say, the UK to Australia and then and they then did like sleep. a VO2 max. Yeah. So oh, you wow. didn't really so sleep the, on You're out of their the, circadian rhythms and totally out of circadian out of them, rhythm. Like yeah. that's, that's different than me lying in bed. Yeah. not going into a restful sleep like just lying there i'm mm-hmm. still like probably getting the benefits yeah. yeah yeah that's not like you know i hopped on a plane i literally couldn't sleep because i'm on a plane the whole night as you mm-hmm. said different time zone different then I get, food and travel yeah, I, hop and... Out, I hop out of a plane and i get on and try to do a max test mm. like, he didn't mention any of that he just mentioned oh this is why sleep's important Mm. so you know it's like we can all and then it makes you worry that like oh if you don't get a decent night's sleep the night before you a wink yeah <laughs> <laughs> i didn't have an erase on i was just like in bed and i just i about two in the morning like because trying to sleep is like trying to lose your keys like you know yeah. you, need to, <laughs> you know and i was like i just need to look this study up tomorrow because i can't go through life like this thinking this mm-hmm. isn't that important and then when I realized it's like, no, it's not that it's not like that. It's like if you're just regularly sleeping, I've I've run really well sleeping absolutely terrible the night before races. And then I've slept really I've run well sleeping, like sleeping great. And I've run crap sleeping great. And I've run crap sleeping crap. It's once you're physically fit, all those little things don't matter. Mm hmm. I guess it's the what you do most of the time that does matter. So yes. it, it's good for for everybody that's you know like can't sleep the night before a race because I think like a lot of a lot of runners um, have that problem, especially marathons because you you're you know you're sleeping the night before in a hotel bed, so it's yeah. not your bed, it's not your room. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of that, and I know a lot of people probably don't sleep as well as they would at home. So no. good to know that like it won't really Doesn't as matter. long as your Doesn't other matter. your the rest of your um your sleep during the week was uh was okay. Then. Yeah, even then, because I've had it where people were like, it's not the I used to never sleep the night before a race. And then someone's like, Oh, it's not that night, it's the two nights before. And mm-hmm. all that happened was I just stopped sleeping two nights before. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, Why did you tell me that? At least I used to have one good night. Yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. It didn't matter either. It's just, it's just like, look, if you're generally, if you're fit, you'll run well. And if you're not, you'll come up with it. it like, you'll be able to read. That's the reason. You'll have some justification. So, yeah. So, Owen, if uh, people want to follow you to uh, read some more of your articles, like the new ones that you're going to come out with, um, or, or, you know, they're interested in the sports Pilates course that you have to offer, where can they reach you? Yeah, thanks, guys. I actually honestly love this podcast. Uh, yeah, so the best place is Everard, E-V-E-R-A-R-D, Pilates, P-I-L-A-T-E-S dot com um, slash book. And you'll get the book for free that we've been talking about. You can download it. Um, if you go to Everardpilates dot com slash sport free trial or just go to Everardpilates dot com, top right hand corner, you'll see a free trial. Try the class for a week. Um you can try it out and you'll see the type of exercises and the type of intensity you have. So that's the best place to get me. Perfect. Oh, sorry. And backawarebelt.com as well. Just check that out. Oh, okay. Forgot about that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, and yourself, what are you up to? What are you up to at the moment? Are you, are you continuing to write articles? Is this, is this an, an ongoing, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Thing where there are articles, new articles coming out. Yeah, I need to I need to update the book. Yeah, I have a good few articles still to put into it now. Um, basically, because there's newspapers around, I just do a big like bunch of them, and then the editor angrily like writes to me, not angry, but it'd be like, "Here, listen, you haven't. We need new articles," and I panic and put them all back down. So <laughs> that's the way it normally goes. Okay, okay so I good. guess. And are, are you up to any running exploits? Uh, just took my break there so yeah I would have there's a kind of Peugeot race series thing here I would have won 
just like 5k and 10k's on the road and yeah. um yeah just build towards cross country now next year okay. circle of life okay good luck with that thank you and best of luck in the marathon guys yeah thanks mm-hmm. yeah it's uh it's october 1st so it's like kind of far but not really yeah can, yeah get into the <laughs> you, you can tell if it's unsuccessful because you'll have uh people you have extra, some extra people contacting you mm. for uh some uh, lactic testing uh just, honestly guys uh, like even after, after it just October. just give us a buzz and uh, i'll try to set that up for you no problem okay that uh, could be good yeah that yeah definitely just seems something different yeah mm-hmm. so that that'll be our, our next thing to try because we keep yeah. trying to build our learning and build our efforts so many thoughts on the book okay so so the book as we've said the book's actually a collection of articles and newsletters um, how about there are heaps of good tips and advice. I guess one of the advantages, you haven't got a consistency of story, but what you've got is you've got um, a certain richness because they're very concise, the information. So just reading through the thing, it gets you thinking about different aspects of your running. You can dip into it where you want to. And there are small aha moments or reminders of things that you probably knew already if you're an active runner but it's good to get reminded and get reminded in a bit more detail than 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 you remember also we haven't mentioned it but there are quite a lot in the newsletters there are quite a lot of diagrams so if you're a visual learner um you know if you don't like reading words so much and you'd rather look at diagrams and and interpret you know a big a poster or a diagram there's quite a few of those in there and uh, the benefit of the electronic thing the big color big color diagrams in the electronic version that I was reading, which was quite cool. So um, I will just start off by saying that there is uh, like no reason not to have this book because it's free just when you subscribe to Owen's email list. So I would say that everyone should have it because there is no excuse. Um, And um, I I guess I'll echo a little bit what Alan said, but um, I would think this book is for, it's ideal for people that, maybe they don't usually read entire books like they like shorter form content like magazines it's a bit it reads a bit like a magazine because every article is standalone and you can kind of like read the ones you want first and then go back to the ones the other ones later um so it's a great format uh, in that way it's just longer than a magazine um all of the articles are on just like you know good practices that sort of have in some way been around for a long time um, with some more modern tweaks, but I think like all good information that will never really go, um, I was going to say like expire, but it's not a food. I mean, it's just not going to, it's not going to change like things like, like, uh, uh, you know, running intervals in your training and, um, and, you know, having good sleep hygiene and eating well, those are all, uh, just good things that everybody it's the base so if you want to be a better runner that's your that's the base of everything that you should be doing so um in that way the articles uh, were all very well written uh so i really liked the cover artwork which we didn't really talk about it it is a digital version but like it, the cover art is sort of like a black and white with um with like one word, the word possible and the finish line red tape in, in red. Um, everything else is black and white. And I, I just like, I really like the cover. So it's it's sort of like one runner that's breaking the tape in front of a herd of other runners. I don't know. I just thought it was very appropriate. And um, I liked the, um, the practical information about uh, there was some practical information. We didn't really talk about it, uh, about like just when your last speed session should be, um, for certain distances and for 10 K last speed session should be four to five days before a race. Like it's great to have sort of concrete kind of numbers to follow. I remember just out of experience, I would, our trainings were sometimes like a little bit closer to race day than that. Um, but I feel like sometimes I would get on the line a little tired. So just like really good practical information in the book. Mm. Um, so good job. Guys, thanks so much. Jeez, have you ever slated a book? That'd be horrendous at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I was I mean, like, on this uh, review, imagine they were like, it was absolutely terrible. I think, uh, I, think yeah. mistakes. I think I think there's no real like 
terrible books i mean because yeah well if the person i'd be like here listen do you want to exit out of this talk or... <laughs> <laughs> that felt I like mean, a parent the... teacher meeting for a second again yeah i mean i guess it feels kind of like that but i i guess our view is a bit like uh, books are not there aren't really any bad books it's just you know there are books for different types yes. of readers yeah, yeah. I think and so you know like the memoirs like you have people that will read a memoir but they'll never read a training book you know and yeah, you exactly, have runners yeah. that will read all yeah. of the training books but will never read a memoir yeah. kind of thing so I think like there's just yeah. like different you, things for different people I mean, what, what we're assuming is that somebody who likes a storybook where characters are introduced and there's a narrative that develops will hear this podcast and go i'm not i'm not reading that book that's yeah I mean, that's not what i'm looking for yeah that doesn't mean we have to say it's not a good book it is a good book for the area where it is useful um so uh, uh we're biased no, we're, bi words, we're biased we're biased because we 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 love running so all aspects yeah, of so running anything... have value to us. It's just a question of who they apply to. Um, yeah, I was just I was just laughing to myself there. It's like it'd be so yeah. funny if you're like, yeah, just wait there <laughs> one second. So it was one out of five stars. <laughs> Probably the biggest waste of time of uh, my life. Uh, and thanks, thanks for coming on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, don't know. Don't give up the day job. <laughs> at first we at first we kind of thought about the whole like rating system. We thought like, yeah. oh, maybe we should have a rating system, we used you know, to give and them we should stars. have ca categories, mm. but then it's like it's a bit hard, you know, because like you don't want to put off somebody that might like that type of book and I yeah. mean like then how are you going to rate it like okay so let's say you have a category uh good technical information okay fine but then if you're reading a memoir like yeah you might have some information because this is an athlete's story of their career and training and you're going to have training like tidbits and um takeaways you know but it's not a training book so like you're going to have to give that category like one star but the book might yeah. be fantastic you know, yeah, exactly. like that's yeah, so yeah. that's the kind of issue we kind of felt like we were running into. So we're like, ah, we're going away from the whole stars thing. It's, it's I, I think it's like not really relevant. Like, I don't know. Well, it's nicer that you didn't do that in front of me. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, thank you for that. I absolutely love this uh, podcast, guys. Thank you so much. If you, if you have an audio version, it would be great to, to hear you reading it with your Irish accent. I think that lends uh, something. Yeah, I did that. The... Yeah, it's, I think you can download yeah. it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, we have a few teammates that like uh, that like to listen to their books like podcasts, like on the run, you know, so. so. Oh, yeah, that's the same with me. That... I never write, yeah. read it. Only oh, you never I like read. read. Okay. okay. Only fiction. Uh... Uh, fiction Alan, and autobiographies that like chill chill out any kind of uh, like, like technique like that book. that's yeah no i i find um yeah no i find it's too i don't know if it's not like actual like academic i'm like just like i like rather fiction and then i love yeah. listening to podcasts or audiobooks okay. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so alan so alan used to uh read fiction uh before uh, i got him into having this <laughs> podcast with me no. Uh, I don't have any room in my reading. Now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> His schedule is way too busy now. But that's okay. So <laughs> thanks once again, Owen. Absolutely great. Um, it's great talking to you. And uh, it's clear uh, how much passion and enthusiasm you have for, um, you know, not just running, but, you know, the subjects around running uh, from a career phys physiological uh, physiotherapy um, point of view. It's, it's always great to hear people talking passionately about their about their subject and when their subject is running related that's even better thank you thanks a million thank you for listening to another episode of running book reviews a big thank you to owen for spending time with us today and sending us copies of his book um but you, of course you can go and get your own copy of the book as well uh, if you'd like to leave us feedback about how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book you'd like us to review in a future episode please leave us a comment on social media we are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram. And on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. And we're on threads now, I, I, I see. Um, mm. I, I don't know what our handle is on threads, but look for running book reviews on threads. Um, please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released, or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. If you've been listening for a while and you're wondering how you can help us out, there are a few ways. If you're enjoying the podcast, spread the word. 
Tell your friends about us or share a link to your favorite episode with a running partner. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We really like written, short written reviews that helps our ratings on, on Apple. Um, or you can rate us out of spot, on Spotify out of five stars. If, you, if, if you're not getting a good enough dose of running book reviews, you can get more by going to our Buy Me A Coffee site. Just look for running book reviews and you can see a bunch of extra little snippets, outtakes and various articles and photographs that we have on, on our Buy Me A Coffee site. That's all today from Running Book Reviews. Bye for now. Bye.